This here is a surface of a sphere, otherwise known as two-dimensional spherical space or S2. This space is way weirder than first meets the eye. In this video, we'll look into this abyss of spherical space. To see surface of sphere on our flat screens, we need to project it first. There are many ways of doing that, but let's look at three most used ones. Here I have a circle and a line which represents my screen. My goal is to see the colored points. One way I can do this is by projecting the points straight down. This is known as orthographic projection and it's the most intuitive one. Another way is to project from middle. This is known as gnomic projection. When we shift the point we are projecting from to the top, we get stereographic projection. When we look at the triangle on a sphere, we can see that its angles add up to more than 180 degrees, which is normally impossible. Let's walk around the triangle. So here is first corner, then second corner, and we arrive back at the start. Next, straight lines. Here's a straight line connecting two points, but the thing is that this is not the only straight line connecting the two points. Here's another one that's also valid. The only difference is that this one is a little bit longer. The same pattern follows with shapes. This circle has an enclosed area inside of it, but it's not the only area this circle can have. This one is also a valid area as it encloses a space. Here's a question. How many triangles can we construct from three points? Because of areas we get two triangles for free. But we can do better. If we allow for longer lines we can get six more triangles. This totals to eight possible triangles from three points. Isn't that amazing? Here's a single point light on a sphere. When we walk to the other side of the sphere, we can see that it seems that there's another point light, but this is just optical illusion. When light travels half the sphere, it starts to converge again. When the light starts traveling, it starts spreading out but on a sphere, after it travels half a sphere, it starts converging back to one point. That's why we see another point line on the other side. But this is just an illusion. This also affects what Floodlanders would see. This guy looks up at the sky, but what he sees is actually a pretty small portion of a ground on the other side. Again, it's because light first starts spreading, but then it starts converging again. Also, parallel lines aren't a thing on a sphere. For coordinates we normally use X and Y, but that won't work on a sphere. First thing we can do is describe the position as a three-dimensional vector. This is very useful, but let's also look at other ways we can do it. If we take each coordinate as a different rotation, we can get spherical coordinates. These are easily understood and can be used for positioning objects. And more. Lastly, with the same approach, we can get polar coordinates. 
These have use in movement, for example. Tiles are a bit tricky on a sphere. The only regular tilings we can get are from regular polyhedra. And we can get them by inflating them. Here's a cube inflated into a sphere. It tiles the sphere into six chunks. If we want to have more tiles, we can nicely approximate by subdividing. There are also UV tiles, but these one distort tiles pretty badly, and because of that they are not ideal for tiling, but they are easy to use. Distance between two points on a sphere is simply the angle between them. This can be easily computed using some basic linear algebra. Another interesting formula is the area of a triangle, which is just the sum of the angles minus pi. Pythagoras' theorem on a sphere is interesting because it treats the side lengths as angles. This happens because the distance between two points is the angle between them. In this part we looked at two-dimensional spherical space and in next part we'll explore three-dimensional spherical spaces. If you like this kind of content, please like and subscribe, and bye!